well, uh, back to school, back to work, a community conversation about protecting ourselves and our loved ones. I'm Omar Neal. I'll be the moderator for uh, this uh, webinar today. And what we're going to do is we're going to engage uh, professionals uh, in uh, the conversation about how do we keep ourselves and our families and our community safe uh, during the time of COVID. Uh, we are, are going to have a uh, honest, transparent, forthright conversation about things that we know. We're also going to share with you the things that we don't know and uh, how we are trying to figure this thing out together. We have uh, some people who are going to be joining with us uh, that's going to truly lay out uh, the facts from the fiction to get accurate information. Uh, Dr. T and Gloria uh, will be the host uh, and I'd like to bring them on now to just to say hello. <laughs> hey, Omar, how are you doing? Hey, Dr. T. Gloria, how you doing? Hola, Omar. <laughs> I missed <¿Cómo> you. Estás? <laughs> uh, yes, this is back to you. I mean, <laughs> I, I miss you. How have you been? been doing great uh, now up here back to to work and uh it is uh, a very exciting to see all the students and people walking around so we're back live life is a lively campus again yes so yes. Let, let, let me step back you talked about campus and 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 welcome everybody on behalf of the uh, the school of public health uh, here at the university of maryland school of uh, in College Park, uh, University of Maryland here in College Park. And um, we can't get back to work if we don't get back to school and vice versa. Yeah. And I also want to acknowledge uh, our co-sponsor, GOVAX, uh, with support from the State Department of Health, we're able to to bring this this webinar to you. Uh, uh, Mayor Neal, these are, this is our lineup. Uh, uh, we've got the host side uh, introduced. And um, these are the speakers that you're going to uh, uh, be uh, engaging uh, in this conversation this evening. And, and yes. I want, Go ahead, yeah, Doc. Yeah. And I want the, um, and this, you know, we'll, uh, this is being recorded and we'll be able to uh, contact any of the speakers in the follow up. So, uh, again, uh, Gloria Aparicio Blackwell. We we from the very beginning of this pandemic have been working together, and look where we are now. Yeah. Uh, weekly Zoom town halls bringing our communities together. So I'm so Thank glad you. to have you here. Thank you. We have come a long way, and and this is it. It's about creating the environment, creating community, and and getting the information out, the right information out in todos los idiomas, ingles, español, and many other languages that are there. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And Omar Neal, let me just brag on you just a little bit. Not only is, it, is he the former mayor of Tuskegee, Alabama, he literally just celebrated 30 years as a radio talk show host. His show was called You Got the Power. And I am telling you, Omar, I'm just so proud of what you have done. And I was able to hear your show as people called in and talked about you as their mentor. Thank you for being with us here tonight and through this journey. I'm going to throw the ball to you as we set the stage for our panelists. Thank you so much, Dr. T. It's, a, it's an honor to be affiliated with such uh, a wonderful group of people. Let's, let's look uh, at our, our panelists, uh, Dr. L L uh, Yolanda, Lalandra uh, Hancock. Uh, she's the founder and owner of the Delta Health and Wellness Consulting LLC. She's assistant professor of public health at George Washington University School of Public Health, consultant on the Prince George County Board of Health. We also have uh, Dr. James Campbell, who is professor of pediatrics at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, specializing in pediatrics and infectious diseases. We have uh, Dr. Don Newton, professor of environmental health at the University of Maryland School of Public Health, principal investigator of the UMD Stop COVID, as well as uh, we have uh, uh, 
uh, the next slide, please. Uh, we have Dr. Sandra, uh, Sarah, excuse me, Polk, who is assistant uh, professor of pediatrics at John Hopkins uh, School of Medicine, director of Center for uh, Salad uh, Health and Opportunity Latinos, as well as Reverend Dr. Terrace King. He's the CEO of Terrace uh, of King Enterprises, Enterprise Group, LLC, chairman of the Family Lead B uh, Board, excuse me, and of course, uh, senior pastor to Liberty Grace Church of God, retired deputy CIO of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Service. And uh, certainly we have uh, Dr. Sandra Quinn, professor and chair of the Department of Family Science and senior Associate Director of the Medi of the Maryland Center for Health Equity School of Public Health, University of Maryland. And uh, we also have, uh, who else with us? Uh, next I think, slide. Yeah, I think we have our lineup. The next slide is, is a content slide uh, when the time comes. Is, is that, uh, man, what a wonderful lineup. Think about the people we have uh, with us today. It is absolutely uh, incredible. So let's 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 have the conversation. Let's let's have the conversation now. Uh, if I could, let me go to uh, Don Milton, Dr. Don Milton. Don, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about uh, the mask. This notion of to wear a mask or not to wear a mask—that's the question. And we know that uh, with public health, the mitigation measures of wearing the mask, uh, social distancing, washing our hands, outside of vaccination is the best way to keep ourselves safe from COVID. Why do you find people being so resistant to something that could literally save their lives? Well, Mayor Neal, I, I think there's a lot of misinformation going on out there. And uh, you hear all sorts of things about uh, masks and, and people who have preconceived ideas are out there trying to prove they're right. Uh, masks are very benign things uh, and, and you can wear them without adverse effect for a long time. Uh, I, I think that people are just, you know, it's an unfamiliar thing, you know, and, and at first putting them on seemed like, ooh, that's something people somewhere else in the world do. We don't do that around here. You know, I mean, when I would go to Asia, I would see people wearing masks, but I thought, I used to, you know, people in America will never do that, will we? Uh, well, we need to do that. It's actually something we can do for each other because with uh, the kind of masks like the, you know, the standard cloth masks and the better than maybe a little bit, the surgical mask that goes over your ears like this, you know, it. we've shown that, Putting these things on people who have COVID reduces how much virus they put in the air by about half. Now, Don, uh, while you're talking, I'm going to put that infographic up. If there's something you want to speak to on it, and then I'll take it down. Is there anything here that you want to highlight for people? Well, yeah, this this is uh, put together by friends, some old friends of mine at UMass Lowell and up in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts. And you know what the point they're trying to make is that, that when we started out with this pandemic, the virus was not very contagious and it's been getting more and contagious as time goes on. And so up in the mass game gets important. And that's what they're talking about here is how, what, what do different kinds of masks do? You know, just the simple cloth mask and the surgical mask will cut down what people put out in the air by half. It also cut down what you get out of the air by about half. So if you put those two things together and you've reduced it to a quarter and that's pretty good. And if you, if everybody's doing it, we're protecting ourselves and each other at the same time. But now that things, we get into this situation where we got a virus that seems to be getting better and better at going between people, upping your mask game gets important. And that's where, putting a cloth mask on top of a surgical mask to make it tighter on your face makes a big difference because even a surgical mask, the, the filter in it is pretty darn good. The problem is that it leaks a lot. 
because it's not tight against your face. And that's why we start talking about having using, you know, things like N95 masks, which, you know, fit tight against your face, have usually two straps on them, and they don't leak, and they filter a little better, but mainly they don't leak as much. And that makes a big difference, both in how much virus you put out if you're infected and don't know it, and how much you get from other people. One, one of the things too, Don, is that many people felt, in fact, they thought that once I got vaccinated, then that would uh, uh, eliminate uh, my need to wear a mask. Uh, given the Delta variant, uh, we found that not to be the case. Speak to that and how the mixed messaging uh, may have influenced some people's hesitance uh, to wear a mask. Well, you know, the vaccine is fantastic. I mean, this is one of the best vaccines that people, humans have ever made. You know? Humans? Humans. Well, humans make these things. No, no, no. But I'm saying I want the significance no, of what no, you no. think. He's, he's, saying, he's, saying, he's saying this is the best we've seen. Yes. It's a big deal. Right. But this virus is a wily virus. It's a lot wilier than measles, unfortunately. Measles has not figured out how to evolve to get around our vaccine, but didn't take this virus very few, but a few months to do it. And it's not as bad as some, but it's a problem. And so while if you're vaccinated and you get the virus, you're not likely to get very sick and die of it, but we're finding out that you can still maybe get sick a little, but even though the risk is low, but you could also probably give it to other people. And if there's other people around you who might be real vulnerable, maybe, you know, your grandmother uh, got vaccinated, but it doesn't really work for her. Or maybe you've got somebody in your family who's had a kidney transplant. Mm -hmm. You know, th those folks are still going to be very vulnerable. It's very hard to get them to react to the vaccine. And I'm sure Dr. Campbell can tell you a whole lot more about it because he's a vaccine expert and I'm not. I'm a mask expert, okay? <laughs> and what, what I think we need to be continuing to do, we've been talking about layers, the Swiss cheese idea. You know, it's like you can get through one hole, but if all the holes don't line up, it's not going to get to you. And that's what we're trying to do. And the vaccine is the best layer. It's got the fewest holes in it. But it's still got it some, and we need the other layers. We need ventilation. We need a lot, of, a lot of clean air. And one way to clean the air is to wear a mask that's cleaning it right where you're breathing it. Yeah. You know, a lot of uh, emotions, thanks, Don, a lot of emotions, feelings uh, are being conjured uh, as we uh, go through this pandemic. Uh, a lot of ups and downs. Uh, again, confusion as to what we should do or what's next. Uh, and so we want to gauge that uh, with our audience today. And so Dr. T, walk them through the word cloud. So what we'd like you to do uh, in the chat and wait till I say go is to, is to write uh, a word that best characterizes, here, here's the question, here's, here's the question. Here's the question. What word best characterizes how you're feeling right now about going back to school or going back to work? One word, uh, just separated by a comma, word, comma, word, comma. Let it flow. Do not hit return. I'll count you down. We'll hit return together. And then we'll have a word cloud waterfall. And I've got people behind the scenes that will build that for us. And then we'll ask you, uh, each of you, as you begin to talk, what your word is. So right now, Start right now. Uh, our friends out there in Facebook, uh, Omar, we got the friends in Facebook watching us live right now. You can use uh, your chats as well and uh, put those words in. What word best characterizes how you're feeling right now about going back to school or going back to work? Don't hit return. Not yet. And I'll yep. count you down. Okay, Thanks, we're ready sir. for the countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Keep those words coming. 5, 4, 3, 2, hit return. There we go. 
And uh, when when Cameron Smith, uh, when Cameron Thurston behind the scenes has the cloud ready, he'll let us know. But uh, our panelists can speak to what they uh, are thinking. You got the yeah. floor back, uh, Mayor Neal. Okay, thanks so very much, Dr. T. I want to go to to uh, Dr. James Campbell, Jim, 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 Jim. Uh, you know, Don was just sharing with us that uh, you know the mask really can help mitigate the spread. But the, the best thing we've seen since sliced bread is this vaccine. So we want to talk a little bit about uh, the efficacy and the safety of this vaccine. And, and, and the other thing is too, and this is something that I think is worth noting, is that vaccines are not new. We've had vaccines for, uh, why, are, why is this so controversial? And when this is the best one we've had. Ever. Ever. <laughs> you know, I, you know let, let me say, let me just say this. Growing up as a child, I've had every kind of vaccine. They lined us up to get vaccines, right? And nobody questioned it. We, we just did it knowing that it was for our collective good. And, you know, so I want you to help us to understand what this vaccine is, how safe and effective it is. And, and how we don't need to have this vaccine be the boogeyman. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks, Mayor Neal. Um, yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, the history of public health, uh, the two top things that have made us healthier over centuries uh, are cleaning our water and vaccines. Like there are, there's nothing else even close. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we've just had great successes. So, so much so that people have essentially forgotten. Like when I bring up diphtheria, they're like, well, what is that? And, you know, no one thinks polio exists anymore and smallpox is gone. All of those are gone because of vaccines. So, you know, we're, we're, we're passionate about continuing to develop more vaccines to try to reduce infections. But COVID vaccines, you know, it's a new virus. And because it's a new virus, these are new vaccines. And I think anything novel, it scares us. You know, we say, well, how do you know if it's new that it's going to work? And how do you know if it's quote new that it's going to be effective? Well, you know, the way we know is not because we just develop it and then we say we think it's going to work. It's because we, people in my world, we spend all of our days and some of our nights um, working on developing these vaccines. And by developing, I mean testing them. So big studies with people followed very carefully. That's what I've been doing all day today and for the last 18 months is vaccinating people with the Moderna vaccine, with the Pfizer vaccine, with the Novavax vaccine, with all of them. And then every day following them and seeing, are they protected against COVID? And what kind of immune responses do they have? And do they report any safety problems, side effects or medical problems afterwards? And, um, you know, we, you know, people have been critical, if you will, that saying that things have, quote, moved too fast. Um, but the truth of the matter is, like, I was working on 10 different vaccines when COVID hit, and we had to kind of stop what we were doing, just like everybody else in my world so that we could work on COVID vaccines. And things can move a lot faster when you put a lot of money and effort and human capital and mm -hmm. you know all the things that we've done over these last 18 months. So they've moved quickly, not because we've cut corners, but because we've put a lot of effort and a lot of work and a lot of volunteers and a lot, a lot of money into developing them. So people should realize if you compare co the COVID vaccines that we have in the US now, through many of our other vaccines, their efficacy, meaning the percent reduction in risk if you're exposed to COVID, is among the best of any vaccine that has ever been developed. Uh, it's it's phenomenal, and you know the the FDA said we will only accept when a company sends us a COVID vaccine results that have at least fifty percent efficacy. That's what your target is, 50. And the first one was 94. And the next one was 95. Um, the reduction in risk is really, really large. Now, the media makes a big deal 
out of, and of course, we, we study very carefully um, risks associated with this, side effects. Um, and every vaccine has minor side effects. Everybody who's ever gotten a flu shot or has ever gotten a tetanus shot realizes you're going to get a sore arm maybe, and you, you may feel a little under the weather the next day, but we tolerate that because it protects us against really bad diseases. It's the same with the COVID vaccine. You know, I want side effects people get, but yeah. those major problems that make it a lot in the news and you know make headlines, they are uncommon to extraordinarily rare. Not to say that they're they don't exist, but you know, you gotta like everything you do in life, you have to weigh what benefits do I get from this choice versus what risks am I taking on. The okay. benefits of 95% reduction versus the risks of, you know, the, the, the side effects of the vaccine. You know, our job, I think, is to get that information out and then for people to make those decisions. You know, people talk about breakthrough. Uh, people who are vaccinated, uh, who uh, contract COVID. Uh, talk a little bit about that and uh, weigh the cost-benefit analysis from that perspective as well. COVID, especially for adults, is a horrible disease, especially for older adults and for people who have um, any underlying medical problem. And if the vaccine can prevent, as, as Dr. Milton Don had mentioned, if it can prevent severe disease, that's the number one thing that we ask of our vaccines. In other words, keeps you out, away from the doctor, keeps you out of the hospital, keeps you from being on a ventilator, keeps you out of the ICU and keeps you from dying. And despite the fact that the, vac the virus has mutated enough to be able to have some breakthroughs, those breakthroughs are primarily leading to things like colds and you know, minor infections, not hospitalizations. The very large percentage of those people who are currently hospitalized, and I see the list in our hospital every single day, they're unvaccinated. So yes, there are breakthroughs, meaning you get vaccinated and you still get the disease, but not severe. So, you know, for me and for my patients, my family, for everyone, we want to not have to go through being in a hospital and being really sick. So vaccines, even with the mutations, even with the variants, are still holding up to prevent those severe diseases. You know, you know it's interesting. I'm a former police officer, and we wore um, uh, body armor. Uh, you know, and uh, if you get shot in the head, it does not to work. But you never have a police not wear his uh, body armor. You see what I'm saying? So the point of the matter Absolutely. is, it it does help you. And so what we're trying to do is is say that, that, you know, you're trying to do the best you can to survive a pandemic. And, and this is the best way we know to do it. The, the, the other thing, and I think it's important to note, this is not just something that happened in the United States. You have scientists and, and, and epidemiologists from all over the world were working and collaborating on this. And so that's what has really made it make more sense to me that this is not a conspiracy against anybody in the United States. This was a global pandemic. And so we had people all over the world trying to figure out how they how they were going to save humanity. Is that kind of right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, everywhere around the world, people are working on this. Um, and, you know, uh, it's not a conspiracy. Uh, vaccines are not a conspiracy. I mean, I work on, I've been working on vaccines my entire medical career since I've been working on infectious diseases. And most of the time I do it, quote, in the dark, like nobody's having me on a webinar at seven o'clock at night wanting to talk about RSV vaccines, which I was doing before, and pneumococcal vaccines. This is the same process, the same work, the same people who are dedicated to trying to reduce disease for people. We're the, I want a vaccine for myself. I want a vaccine for my mom and dad. I work really hard to make sure my kids can get vaccines and everybody else. There's no conspiracy. It's, it's just we're passionate about something that we know is a great public health benefit. And we, we put all of our minds and our hands and our lives you know, to, to study these things. So yeah, no. I, it's difficult to convince people that there's no conspiracy, but there's not. These are just hardworking doctors and scientists trying to make it better for everyone. 
Well, I'm so glad that you are doing that and have dedicated your life to do that. Uh, Dr. Sarah Pope has uh, joined us. How are you doing? As well as uh, Dr. Uh, Yolandra uh, Hancock. How are you doing? Welcome. Uh, let, let, let's, uh, Dr. Pope, I'm going I'm to go to you. I mean, you're starting uh, in, but I, we want to talk about uh, going back to school and, and the mental health of our children. Uh, you know, for the last year, we have engaged in distant learning or remote learning, uh, and many of the children are have cabin fever, being in the house, uh, and we know that uh, there is uh, great disparity in terms of how certain children fare on uh, remote learning versus others um, due to the lack of broadband or the lack of computers in the home or just the, you know, being in a noisy environment. Uh, and so, you know, the mental health of children has taken a hit. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how do we stabilize children in the midst of a pandemic, right, at the same time keep them safe. Yeah, I think it really gets immediately back to what Dr. Campbell was talking about is um, while it may not seem the obvious answer to your specific question, I think the answer is we vaccinate everyone who's vaccinatable, who's eligible for the vaccine. Because I think recovery for kids at a population level is going to come via a return to a more normal life, which almost always means going to school every day outside of your house and spending time with your peers. Um, and that's only going to be possible, and it's, on, and it's only going to be safe if we can keep COVID out of the schools uh, to a very large extent. And there are kids who are too young to be vaccinated, but they can be protected um, if the people who love them and live with them are vaccinated, um, because that's a way to sort of interrupt virus transmission and keep the virus away from kids. Um, so not necessarily a, an obvious direct answer, but, uh, it's yeah. the answer. You know I, 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 you know, I wanted you to do that because I'm going to ask, uh, uh, Dr. Hancock, the same question, but, but, you know, I'm not talking to Gloria, Gloria, you know, we're talking about, uh, different communities, obviously the African-American community, uh, the Latino community, uh, we, we, you know, we, we have different challenges. Uh, how, how have you seen this? this uh, notion of, of getting our children in a safe space at the same time, educating them. Listen, that has been a, 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 a true labor of work or labor of love to get the schools to provide them the necessary tool for them to continue on getting their right education, getting the access to, to their books and to the teachers and all of that. But it hasn't been easy. But still, that idea of going back to the classroom and having families that are not really believing in this mask issues is, is a real challenge. It's a real challenge, not only for the immigrant community, but for everyone in the community, period. So I think that, um, uh, Dr. Campbell, I, I wanted to know more about how agencies can really get the message straight because when you hear the CDC saying something and you hear other entities saying something else and you get the pharmaceuticals doing something different, people get confused. They are confused already. Yeah? They are skeptical. So that's the kind of things that I'm always trying to see. How could we get a straight message through social media? Because social media is another one that is distorting the whole conversation and people believe on that they believe the social uh, the social network and that sometimes is not the real story that's not the real uh, truth and and that's something that we need to be combating as well and I'm going to tell you I'm from Venezuela and right now my three brother my two brothers and sister almost died from COVID and they didn't have access to the vaccine. It's very difficult. They had to get it through the through the um, the black market, and you don't know even what you're getting. And here in this country, you have it in any corner and any street that you wanted to. So you see the unfairness in life. And I hope people understand that this is not a joke. This is something yeah. that is impacting every day to a lot of people in this country and in the world. Uh 
um, really important points. Um, and I was struck by the fact that uh, Mayor Neal's radio show is called You've Got the Power. Um, <laughs> and I think everyone who's listening should say like, you've got the power, which is, you know, take it on yourself to, to find information that will help you and your family and not like, I don't know much about repairing cars and I don't go on social media to find out what people who are not mechanics tell me about fixing my car. Like I go to the mechanic and um, I think, you know, we have a lot of people in the United States who have a lot of expertise, spend a lot of time in school and, and a lot of work to try to get to the point where you, you can be an, an quote expert in fields. So, you know, be careful about from whom you take information and that you do quote have the power to to change your lives by by you know listening to to people who, who give you those messages i i completely agree about that the message coming from all of our messengers you know needs to be clear succinct and simple but i think also the listeners have to realize that there will be change that we, we sort of have the expectation because we're used to diseases that have been around for a long time, that there's very slow change in messaging. And with diseases like this, where things are changing rapidly, new vaccines and new variants, I think the message is going to change. So we just have to expect for a while until this thing calms down that we're going to get changes in messages. But at the same time, we should expect our leaders to provide when they change to provide very clear messaging about what we all need to do to protect ourselves and our families. You know, at the same time, I think that the people who know we have to put them out there more than because the people who don't know have are very vocal. And, and very creative. Uh, and, 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 and creative in yeah. ways to reach people. And, and so we need to we need to do that. Uh, uh, let's go. Let's go and see what the crowd cloud says. Let's go to the clouds. Okay, uh, Ken. And see see what the clouds say, and then we're going to come back because I got some questions uh, to ask. Anxious uh, it seems to be uh, okay. the prevailing thought. Uh, nervous, apprehensive, hopeful, optimistic, grateful, appreciative, confident, curious, afraid, concerned, and the worry. worried. Worried. Uh, I guess uh, those are the feelings that people who are at least on 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 this uh, webinar are feeling and and you know nervous and, and I guess it's nervous because you know things are are moving we're talking about a new variant coming out of South Africa uh, we just now uh, we're talking about the Delta variant uh, in three months ago I think we were at two percent with the Delta variant now it's over 95 percent and so when we see things move and shift so quickly, uh, it, it does create some uh, anxiety and some nervousness uh, ab about this because we don't know. You all know more. So you are going to have to help us to understand not only what's happening, but what we can do uh, to mitigate and to safeguard ourselves and, and our families' lives. Um, let's, 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 uh, thanks, thanks so much uh, for that. Let's take that down uh, so I can bring on... Uh, another person, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Yolandra uh, Hancock, I want, I want to talk with you a minute, uh, you know, because, you know, this whole mental health thing about children and transitioning children back to school. Uh, today on my talk show, I had uh, the vice president of the Florida Education Association, and they are battling uh, in Florida uh, with not only, you know, the political thing of, of people saying you cannot mandate masks, but also dealing with, um, you know, parents and citizens going to school boards, uh, attacking school board members and physicians. And, you know, I mean, this has really gotten to be very heated. And so I guess the question has to be, how do we you know, navigate these waters uh, and, and try to stabilize the ship where we can have our children not be so anxious about what's happening, getting mixed messaging, not only in the social uh, uh, social sphere or the social media sphere, but also from their parents who are telling them, 
you don't have to wear no mask. And, and then the school system says, wear a mask. How, how, do we, I, how do we deal with that? It's an excellent question. And you know, when I think through it, especially as both a pediatrician and as a mom, this isn't anything new for me. I trained in California. Uh, I went to med school at UCLA and then my, did my pediatric residency training at Cedar sinai Medical Center, where I swear it was the birthing of the anti-vaxxer movement. And so it's what I've gotten used to over time in terms of what I know to be true in terms of science and evidence and what personal opinion is. And it goes back to your point, Mr. Neal, who has the loudest voice, right? So if on TikTok, random mother says that this vaccine or wearing a mask specifically causes a trapping of carbon dioxide, right? That it prohibits oxygen exchange. But our voices aren't heard in terms of explaining that wearing a mask is safe. At my longest, I think I had an N95 mask on for 12 hours working in the emergency department during the H1N1 epidemic back in 2009. And based on what I know to be true and those around me, I have not lost any brain cells, right? I wear an N95 mask seeing patients every single day now. And I'm just as sharp at 48 as I was at 28. And so I think it's important for us to speak to what the nonsense is and shame on publications like JAMA because the Journal of American Medical Association actually published an article where some whack group decided to push out this notion that somehow children wearing masks trapped carbon dioxide. What they did not report out is how it was measured. They didn't, of course, you're going to, if you measure ex exhaled air, you're going to measure carbon dioxide because that shows you that the lungs are working. The only way that you can tell that a child is what we call hypercapnic or meaning that they're trapping carbon dioxide is by doing an arterial blood gas, right? That's how we know that they are trapping carbon dioxide. We can take a pulse ox, all these different things to show that children are functioning very well. I sent my daughter back to school last January. I prayed over her, pled the blood of Jesus over her and sent her back because she cried. She begged me to send her back to school, no matter how anxious, nervous, or afraid I was for my child, I knew for her mental, emotional, and psychological health, as well as her social development, that she needed to go back to school. So I sent her to school with an N95 mask on. She still tested at the top of her class with her standardized exams. It did not impair her. We have to have voice to counter the noise. Number two, number one. Number two, we have to call people out. If you say you are a doctor and you're claiming all these things, but then I find out you're a doctor who got not knocked uh, degrees online. I got my MPH predominantly from the Bloomberg School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins University online. But if you got it online six months ago and your major was basket weaving, but you got a PhD because you bought it, someone mm -hmm. needs to put that out there that this person does not have a PhD in virology, immunology, epidemiology, medicine, none of that. Who, who are these experts? When we call those people out in a very diplomatic and respectful way to let people know, hey, pay attention to who your experts are, that will help us in this conversation. Yeah, PhD from Sears and Roebuck don't uh, really cut it. Huh? Or Facebook. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we, we talk about comorbidities and, and uh, many uh, 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 people, particularly in the African-American community, talk about I don't know how uh, the vaccine will interface with my high potential uh, potential uh, or my uh, diabetes or, or, or whatever, or even obesity. How, how, how do you talk to people who already have health issues and are afraid that this will exacerbate? You want me to take that one? Take, take that one and then I'm going to go to someone else. Yeah. Absolutely. What I tell them is what we do know is how COVID interacts with all of those, right? We know that obesity is a leading risk factor for COVID-19 complications and death among adults and in the pediatric population. What we know is that heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension are all risk factors independently when it comes to COVID-19 severity and death. So I always tell folks, you have to go with what you know. What we know is you need to protect yourself against this because the predominance of people who have died from COVID who've had comorbidities, it has been people dealing with obesity particularly and then those other chronic diseases. And so you either play Russian roulette 
with a bigger, badder version of covert, the biggest, baddest version we've ever seen, or you get yourself protected knowing that in the randomized control trial and in the millions, over almost 200 million, actually over 200 million people who have now received at least a single dose, we have not seen in any data that there's an association between any of those chronic diseases and any adverse outcomes. Mm, that's powerful. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Hancock mentioned the blood of Jesus, Reverend King, and I know you. I, I saw heard you, that. You know, I saw you spurt. You know, that. I saw something just rose up in you. So I'm <laughs> certainly going to go back to you because there have been people who have decided that they're going to just uh, pray and uh, and 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 allow that to be their protection, right? And uh, even there are individuals who are part of the clergy who tell people not to get vaccinated, that uh, that is the antithesis of faith. How, how do you respond to that being a man of the cloth, the clergy? I think is a couple things. And first I have to start with this piece. As a trusted source, my trust in terms of my community and congregation didn't begin with COVID. They had trust in me because I served them before they ever knew what COVID was. And so I went into this with enough capital, enough trust for them to say, we're going to believe in the stage that he sets. So as an occupational science, and as a former federal policy maker at a senior level in healthcare, and then as their pastor and as their community leader, I could set the stage to say, I understand there's a difference between facts and truth. Now there may be many facts and you can argue with those if you want to or not. And as far as what other religious leaders say, I have never given that any attention. Just like any other vocation or profession, there are going to be people who give misinformation and miseducation, and I'm not responsible for any of that. But what I do is bring science and faith together and stay in the atmosphere of the church that God is supreme, but we're going to listen to the pharmaceutical organization. We had Pfizer and Sanofi and Hopkins on the line in a prayer service for my church. And I ran it just as I would any Sunday morning service. And we're not going to be disrespectful. And I'm going to be respectful of even the anti-vacciners in my flock. And where I see, and I understand that uh, just as their facts, as we're talking about today, as it relates to COVID, my legitimacy and my community and my congregation is because I too recognize the facts of unequal treatment. So I'm quick to say, look, all that's true, but I understand why you don't trust the hospital. I understand why you don't trust the clinician, but I want you to listen to the facts and we're going to work with your faith and we're going to take a faith ball. And I'm not going to push you in any direction but I'm going to give you the information and then we're going to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, let me ask this because, uh, you know, I've always heard that we are all entitled to our own opinion, but we're not entitled to our own facts. Right. And there are some facts that we do know. Uh, we do know that uh, 630 plus maybe 40,000 people have died of COVID. We, we know that at least. Right. And, and we do know that uh, this new variant, is more transmissible than the previous variant. We do know that right now in the state of Alabama, not one ICU bed is available because they are occupied by COVID patients. 
right? So we, there are some facts that we do know. And, and, and the first time when people were first, you know, when we first was, was introduced to COVID, people had more patience. Uh, but now that we have had, as someone said, over 200 million people being vaccinated with no significant negative outcomes, when do we get to a point where we are, are being more deliberate and intentional about saying, you know, you need to protect yourself and you need to protect me too? Because a lot of your fellow parishioners uh, and, 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 and pastors uh, have, uh, uh, have been, uh, have contracted COVID and died because their, their uh, people came into the church and was able to spread COVID. So, so I, I guess I wish those were the only facts that we do. I also, in talking with my millennials, who right now we've moved this process from, I lead the interfaith vaccine effort for Baltimore City for the health department. And I have reached across the aisle to my Jewish brothers and my brothers in the nation of Islam. We worked the process first to have people come to our sacred space. Now we're going into the community and offering mobile vaccines. So we, we know the facts, but when in this area, now that I'm not looking at this from a national perspective, in Baltimore, in order to push and have people hear me, one of the things most important is not to confront them in the way we're talking about. Most important for me, if this is about effectiveness, mm -hmm. is to say, I know and in fact, for me to quote first, the disenfranchisement that exists in Baltimore, the mistreatment that they have received from hospital systems in Baltimore. So I beat them to the punch in terms of talking about other facts that are real, that I've seen in my congregation, that I've seen amputation rates, and I've heard conversations that are absolutely ridiculous that people of color have been treated. People in my congregation would be crazy to trust the hospital system in Baltimore. And I have to acknowledge those facts first, and then we can begin to have a legitimate conversation because yeah. then they know I'm not representing the system. I never do. Dr. Thomas knows that. That's why he has me on here. I represent my people. And once I get to that point, then we can have a real conversation about risk, about effect to your family, because then they see me not as paternal in this city. The thing that is distasteful the most is an educated Black man who comes at them in a way as if they don't have common sense. And they do. And I began to have the conversation that says, look, you know, now I'm empathetic. Now I'm walking in your shoes. Now I've been through your issues. And now we be can begin to weigh the balance and make a decision to get you a vaccine. And it has worked, not just in terms of COVID, but flu. And I also have to push the system to say, we're not just going to talk about COVID because you just showed up on our doorstep talking about health because of COVID, because our disease affects you. No, we're going to talk about how you're going to address these other issues related to screening our women who died 40% more to breast cancer. We're going to talk about whether we should have prostate cancer screening or not. We're going to talk about diabetes education and an immunization program because this should have been done before COVID ever came. Yeah, and let, so let me I ask know the script, but I'm never yeah. going by the script. I'm let, going let, by know, the community. 
you know, Dr. King, I, I agree with you. That's why I want to I want to bring uh, Dr. Quinn on, Dr. Sandra Quinn. Uh, Dr. Dr. King makes a lot of very salient points. I'm, I'm, I'm not none of which I I'm going to argue with. The difference is that we have many issues, and, and I've heard you say uh, multiple times that you know that the system has been unfair to segments of the population. I've heard you say that, and, 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 and that's true. And, and those are issues that we need to deal with. But I want us to, to live to deal with those issues. You see, the, the immediacy of COVID in particular, the Delta variant can literally take you out in a couple of weeks. Uh, the systemic issues of racism and discrimination and, and disparate treatment within our public health system is a more is a larger problem. So I, I want you to help me, uh, Dr. Quinn. Uh, how, do, how do we tell people, yeah, we, we acknowledge, as Dr. King has said, we acknowledge that those issues exist. But what we want you to do is live so we can deal with those issues. Yeah, you know, I, <clears throat> I, I think that is the key point. And but Dr. King also said and it is he talked about empathy. And, you know, I, I we, being empathetic and acknowledging those, you know, those pains, the ongoing racism, discrimination people still encounter in their daily lives. And, and Dr. Polk um, is part of the Communivax team that uh, Dr. Thomas and I are on, and, and she works with the Latino community in Baltimore. And so, you know, who have their own set of struggles with authorities. So I think it's, you know, there's no question, and Dr. Thomas and I have talked about this a lot, that the health systems here in Prince George's County that are, are now eager partners is we need literally to have them sign on the dotted line that they will be eager partners doing colorectal, you know, screenings. They will be eager, eager partners doing diabetes education they will be eager partners coming out and giving flu shots in a couple of weeks, you know, which is vitally important. So I think it's also for some of us as and working with our community. She said, this is not something that affects children, which was something, it's almost like that was a different virus a year and a half ago than the one we have now. And that doesn't mean it's always affected children. But now we're in a different ballgame. And I'd really like to, I think, having Dr. Campbell put some stats up, talk about Dr. Hancock, Dr. Polk, who all, you know, can address sort of what do parents and teachers really need to be thinking about here that acknowledges, I believe they want to do the right thing for their kids. You know, every parent wants to do the right thing for their kids. Now, we, how do we hear their fear and hear their anger and help them do the right thing? I pick one of your well, pediatricians uh, and go around the, uh, go around the yeah, 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 I think I think that's an excellent question, uh, uh, Dr. Quinn. Uh, let, let, let me ask you. Um, let's 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 go, Dr. Pope. Uh, let's 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 ask you this: how 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 do we address that? Because parents are. Uh, in a quandary. Uh, they don't know what to do. Many of them have children under the age of 12 that cannot get the vaccine. How do, how do you protect them? Uh, at the same time, understanding that they have to have a life too. Uh, that you cannot put them in a bubble through, you know, permanently. So, you know, how do, how do parents balance that? Well, I think we we know that the best way to protect kids is for as many people who are eligible eligible to get vaccine vaccinated as possible. To um, and then second, the kids in schools need to wear masks. So those are sort of the two the two most important actions that we can all take communally to protect young kids. And I would like to comment on on the issue of are kids at risk from COVID? And sadly it is now very clear that COVID poses a significant risk to kids. Um, fortunately, the numbers are not very high, 
and I'm gonna pass it to my colleagues for more comments on numbers. But what is scary to me as a pediatrician is that is the degree of unpredictability of COVID, which is very similar um, to the unpredictability of flu. So when I think of all the kids I take care of every winter, when the flu comes around, I, I worry my kids with heart disease extra. I worry extra about my kids with asthma, but everybody else, I have to worry about some because every winter, some kids die from flu who were totally healthy. And I can't pick out in a crowd who they would be. I can't, I don't have any way to predict them. So I just vaccinate as many of the kids as I can take care of as possible. And COVID is similar. There are kids that we worry about extra. We worry extra about obese kids. We worry extra about kids with asthma. We worry extra about kids who are already sick for whatever reason. But there are healthy kids walking around that are gonna at risk of a terrible outcome from COVID. And so we have to be careful about all kids and we cannot assume that any kid has a free pass. That's that's a powerful statement. Let me let me just say this as I move to uh, back to you, uh, Dr. Hancock. Um, today again, I had the conversation about how do you send children back to school in a safe space, and uh, it was told to me that six children in Florida have already succumbed to COVID, and school started this month. Well, last month six children, 51 staff members have already succumbed to COVID, contracting COVID during this period, whether or not it was at school or not. These are the statistics that were just sent to me or just said to me today. And so when you look at that, because initially the messaging was, and you have to agree with this, that children are less susceptible to the virus. And so people kind of thought that the children had a pass. And that also translated into younger people uh, under the age of 40 thinking that they were somehow uh, immune from the uh, disease of uh, the virus. And so this kind of infallibility that young people have naturally, invincibility, right, uh, is now being challenged with the reality that you can die too, even if you are a healthy, young, healthy person. D Dr. Hancock, the messaging kind of confused people, right? Absolutely. From the beginning of the pandemic, that has been the consistent messaging all the way through until the Delta variant showed up. Um, unfortunately, particularly among Black and Brown children, that was not the narrative, even in the beginning of the pandemic. 75% of children who died from COVID-19 were black or brown. 80% um, of children who had what we call multi-system inflammatory syndrome, the complications leading after having recovered from COVID itself. And then in terms of our children experiencing loss, black and brown children have experienced this pandemic in a completely different way. And that has not been reported out a lot. We have very little evidence about information about long COVID among pediatric populations. Luckily, um, healthcare organizations like Children's National Medical Systems will be doing that work. But as it is always the case, little ones get the short end of the stick. Children are not little adults. They need their own data presented so that parents are well informed. When the Delta variant showed up, it changed the script, flipped the script when it came to the number of children. Overarching without within the pandemic, children made up about 14% of the cases. Now children are making up close to 25% of the cases. Between the ages of 12 to 17, only 30% of children are vaccinated uh, against, fully vaccinated against COVID-19. A little over 40% have received at least one shot, right? And we know, as you've mentioned, that under 12, there isn't a vaccine as of yet. And so as adults have gotten vaccinated, just based on basic math, where COVID goes is where we are unvaccinated. So adults who are not vaccinated and children under the age of 12. And what we know based on the data is that children are more likely to acquire COVID-19 from their adults, not child to child transmission. That happens very rarely, particularly under the age of 10. But when you see scenarios like what played out in California, teacher takes her mask off to do read aloud for just a few minutes. 
and infects half of her class. And then those children infect their siblings and then those children infect their parents and others. You see what ends up happening. And unfortunately, Florida is an excellent example of when you legislate politics over public health. And that's what we're seeing with the loss of teachers, with the loss of students, and with the numbers increasing. Success leaves clues. When you look at counties like Los Angeles, when you look at states like Vermont, where over 70% of the children between 12 to 17 are vaccinated, fully vaccinated, we need to use those states as examples. But to Dr. King's point, we also have to understand where parents are coming from. One, in terms of their concerns about the vaccine, we do know that there is an increased risk of myocarditis, particularly among young uh, uh, adolescent boys between the ages of 16, and I consider 24 to still be adolescents because of development, but those are real concerns. So we address those, we talk about those in a diplomatic way, but also to Dr. King's point, we talk about some of the competing interests. A parent's priority may be gun violence in her neighborhood. The bullet's what's gonna take her baby boy out, not COVID-19 that may be her perspective. And so being able to talk real with families so that we understand what they are bringing to the table and in a very non-hierarchical way, just a community conversation like we're having tonight to talk to them about all of those things, including COVID as part of the conversation. Uh, Omar, let me ask you, yeah. Dr. Hancock, I love what you just said. Do you believe that, that parents would benefit from a kind of a conversation like we're having here tonight? Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. So I, I can't imagine not. Right. You know, that's this, this is the conversation I have with families all the time. I just did back to school health physicals with young adults at Maya Angelou High, um, Young Adult Learning Center in Northeast D.C. And of the 150 or so students that I saw between the ages of 18 to 29, 90 percent of them didn't want the COVID-19 vaccine. But by the time we had diplomatic and respectful conversations about what they were concerned about, right? A young man came in with a house arrest bracelet on. He's not tripping off of COVID. But by the time we had our conversation, I said, well, brother, when you get this ankle or this house arrest bracelet off and you get ready to live your best life, what are we going to do to protect you from COVID? Because it would be a doggone shame to have gone through this process, get on probation and then get taken out by COVID. He was like, ooh, sis, that's a good point. <laughs> that's the kind of conversation we need to have so that parents, children, adolescents, like I have these conversations with my 12 and 13 year olds. It isn't just their parents I'm talking to. I'm talking to the boys and girls as well to understand what their perspective is, what their concerns are. And then we address them in a very respectful way. Oh, Dr. Yola, Dr. Yola keeps it real, man. I'm <laughs> loving it. You know, you know what I'm talking about. And to the about. point, that, to, yeah, I'm plain language, I'm plain language. Yeah, and you know, that, that's that's about, Espanol, también. See? <laughs> Hey, and Omar, and Mayor you Omar, <laughs> it sounds like bringing the parents and the kids in these Hollywood squares. But, but we got to have plain talk to people, man. This is what this is about. And uh, Dr. King, you were, I mean, Reverend King, because most doc, most reverends we call doctors anyway, you know, <laughs> uh, down, down here. But, but let, 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 you know, what talk, let's talk about the messenger. So it's not just always the message. It's, it's the messenger. It's, it's who brings the message, right? How, how can we make sure that trusted messengers, because you make your friends before you need them, right? Right? People, people trust people that they know that's been proximate to them, right? How do we make sure that those individuals are equipped with the requisite knowledge, information, facts, if you were, right? to make sure that it gets back to the masses properly? Well, I, I think, first of all, the who's the we? Well, I well, think, and I'm talking, I'm talking, when I, when I say, well, well, let me, let me, I'm let speaking me, of the me, collective me, we, I'm speaking let, of let, everybody. Let me, let, me, let me say why I said that. You know, sometimes it can be facts, but if I'm bringing those facts from an entity that has a history that is a problem, it's a much tougher job. So faith leaders that I advise across the city, and now we're moving this model as Dr. Thomas knows across the country, I say be careful in choosing your partners because remember your credibility is on the line as faith leaders. 
Mm -hmm. And we have to be careful not to sell our credibility. And second, I don't take anyone's message forward. I form the message with you. And I determine what the message is going to be with your facts that is beneficial to my community and congregation. You, you can't come to me and say, this is what I want you to say. That doesn't work. And so I pick the right partners. I educate my partners to understand the context and the history and the pain of my community. Because it's not about urgent death versus later death. Because in Baltimore, with a 300 plus and five years in a row homicide rate, the people I'm talking to, immediate death is not just COVID, it's walking out the door. So if you don't know that, that kind of issue can come across as paternal. So first, mm -hmm. you're going to get an education from me. Mm -hmm. And if you're not willing to get an education from me about the people I represent, that means you are not a worthy partner because you falsely think your facts cause you to be superior in some way to me. So what we have to do is humble ourselves with our degrees and letters. And though I have an earned doctorate, that's not the issue. The issue is I'm working for them. And the issue is just what Sandra picked up because she's heard this from me week after week and month after month. I strive for empathy. So then once we develop the message together, then we deliver the message and I legitimize you. Because what we found out during this COVID is you can't get into certain communities without me. <laughs> what the governor of Maryland found out, if he wanted to deal with the access and equity problem, he could go to Johns Hopkins all day. But until he came to me, he could not get to my people. Sure. Well, well, that that's, and that that's is a, a fact. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, you know, I, 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 I agree with you, and we're going to bring uh, uh, Doctor T on to ask the question. And and I, I, I want to make sure that we understand this: that we all are possessors of some truth, right? And that's as we bring right. our truths together, then and only then do we get closer to the truth, right? And so, and and I also know that that because I'm not. Uh, uh, an epidemiologist, I'm not a, a public health specialist. I have to get information from them and then how I craft the information based on its logic and, 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 and plausibility to me uh, is, is how I know to disseminate it to the people that I normally talk to. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah, I think, I think that's a major part of it, but but I think the biggest part that I'm saying is we have to have mutual ownership and, and shared power related to the formulation, dissemination of the information. Man, you're a poet and don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Dr. T, you're, you're, you're up next. Well, you know what? I, I just love the Hollywood squares. This is the silver lining around the pandemic. It's created an opportunity for us to master this technology. So these barber poles behind me are important because, uh, Reverend King, this is where we have planted the flag to have that listening tour. Uh, Dr. Hancock, this is where we develop that empathy. We bring our medical team in to listen, to listen. Now, Dr. Campbell described the research and the importance of the research, and we all know the importance of having a diverse uh, study population so that the results can be generalized to everyone. And in the first wave, Dr. Campbell, they were very proud, Moderna, Pfizer, all of them, uh, the numbers of African-Americans and Hispanics that they had in their samples so that they could make conclusions for those groups, okay? Now let's come into the world of the pediatric clinical trials. A child cannot sign up themselves. They must have parental consent. What does the demographics look like uh, on the trial, clinical trials with children, and whether you uh, whether that's known or unknown? Um, 
And what's been your experience and any other physicians here, because sometimes you're being asked to recruit into these clinical trials while you're also playing the role, you know, in your role as a physician healer. So what are the dynamics in getting minority parents, black and brown parents to enroll their children in a research study? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, we, together with the other um, researchers and the sponsors, meaning like Moderna and Pfizer and the, the groups and the National Institutes of Health, they often um, help to fund these studies. We work very hard to make sure that across the country that we're reaching all demographics so that when you're done with the study, you have data where everyone can look at the data and say, oh, there were people like me in that study. There were boys, there were girls, there was black, there was white, there was Hispanic, there was non-Hispanic, there was everybody. And if you have enough uh, and make sure that that distribution is, is equitable, if you will, then uh, we can feel then the vaccine has the safety and the efficacy in all of those groups. So typically what's done by the sponsors these days is they look at the demographics where you live and expect you to enroll a demographic similar to where you're recruiting from. So, and that, and for us, I mean, for our pediatric studies, we had an, I've never had a response like this for families that want to be in a study. I mean, I'm typically black scratching black families. Oh yeah. Black families, white families, Hispanic families. Uh, we have, before we started recruiting, like advertising, people knew because we were the Center for Vaccine Development that we would be doing these studies. So we set up a contact list that families could get on the list. And once we had approval, we could reach out to them. We currently have 6,000 children on that list. Um, and we can only enroll uh, we've enrolled a little over a hundred in one of our studies. So very large numbers of people who are wanting to be in the studies. Um, and we're, so that gives us the ability to be able to reach out to black and brown communities and, and families and for them to enroll. So yeah, we have enrolled a lot and, you know, we get updates from the sponsor every week on how things are going with those demographics across the country and then we meeting their targets. So I, I think we'll get there. Um, uh, it's sometimes it is, as you said, it can be difficult to um, people who are hesitant or not only hesitant, but just concerned about being quote, guinea pigs, about being the first, about um, putting their children at risk when they would prefer to wait until other people have done that and then they will have the opportunity to have a licensed vaccine. Uh, that can be difficult in lots of different communities. Um, but for COVID, I think people have realized, one, because of the data that we have in adults already, and two, because of just how serious the disease is that, that um, you know, they are willing to, to be in, the, in these studies. So. Well, I'm encouraged. I, I have found that the, the questions asked by families has not differed much by socioeconomic status, by race, by the language that they speak. It's more by fear of the disease and by wanting to, quote, get back to normal. Like, what can I do for myself, my family, and my community to, quote, get back to normal? Mm -hmm. um, and that normal, you know, uh, may be different for everybody, but um, that's been the overwhelming um, impetus, I would say, for families across the board and, and, and kid, most of the kids. I mean, I talked to them about our partnership and how, um, you know, they're kind of heroes uh, in this whole process, uh, being in these studies. And, and I say everyone, including every one of us who's on this call and who's listening, should be thanking a volunteer, whether they're an adult or a kid who is in a trial. Because the mm -hmm. reason that you got vaccinated and I got vaccinated is because someone decided to be in those trials and because those data then led to us finding out that these vaccines work. Mm -hmm. um, and 
I can't be in the trials because I run the trials. So I'm thankful for everybody who was in them and worked on them. Uh, so That's good. anyway, it's I'm encouraged. You know, thanks, 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 Jim. Um, Sarah, you had something to to say. I want to make sure that you uh, have your point made. Yeah, just I am grateful for um, volunteers, and it is really impressive how quickly uh, trials filled up. Um, I have also been struck by how many colleagues I have who have enrolled their kids. I tried to get my kid in a trial. Um, but my, my, the experience in my practice has been a little bit less rosy. So people often come to me because I work with the immigrant Latino community and people, people often come to me asking me to enroll people. Um, and I do believe that research needs to be representative and, and especially communities that have been so devastated by COVID um, because I have a priori have a lot of confidence in the vaccine. I think they need access to it. Um, but it has highlighted um, th that it's just hard to do this research in a rush. So our site, the site at Hopkins, the lab, you know, where they're gonna do the trial is about 50 feet from my practice. But in an era when I can't have a staff member have a prolonged conversation in person with with a potential um, parent with a parent who might enroll their child, I just don't have a way forward. It just takes there is so much mistrust to overcome, and there's so much information to share that I, I just can't do that in a 20 minute visit. And and it just takes a lot of it, it just takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of trust. And so. Uh, you know, I, I've been disappointed in that I think families potentially could have benefited, um, but it really highlights um, the struggles of, of enrolling um, people that have been historically excluded in research in a hurry and virtually. And so um, I think that in contrast, again, with how many people I have who are fellow health professionals who've enrolled their kids, I just, you know, what can we do between now and Like uh, look like Dr. Polk is, uh, and I, and I Rosa's think uh, Dr. Polk. Go ahead, go ahead Gloria. Yeah, Dr. Polk raised a, a very important uh, uh, point here, which is how do we get our communities involved, the, the vulnerable community? So we usually go after them when we are in this rush or when we need to do this work, but we are not building relationship. I want doctors to go back and start building those those connections with that with that community that they can start thinking about. I can be part of that process because sometimes they don't know. And, and if you go at the last minute, they are going to be hesitant to even to be participant of the research process. But it's up to us to start building those communities right now. And we cannot be waiting until we have a situations like this, that then we have to gain, engage that community. But they yeah. have to be part of it. And also getting into those, you know, I have so many friends that they are getting $1,000 here, $3,000 <laughs> there for the research. They also can be part of that. Why not? Yeah. You know, I, I want, because uh, do you, I can't believe this, but we only have 12 minutes left uh, of a lot of time. Uh, but I want to I want to bring in uh, the, this notion of trust in the context of the Pfizer uh, vaccine being fully approved and whether or not we believe that that will make any difference from the people who are vaccine hesitant. Uh, what, what's the, and, and I'm just going to kind of put this out to the group, uh, not to any specific person, uh, but what do you think that means in, uh, in terms of accelerating vaccine uptake? I'll, I'll jump in, um, Mayor Neal, just because I've done research about public acceptance of EUA vaccines. And so I think for those people who are more skeptical or concerned and, and hesitant about the vaccine, there will be some of those who will be reassured by the, having the full uh, approval by the FDA. I, my fear is, and I, is that it will not be enough to help us through this, this crisis we're in right now. And that's where we see, and this is what I expected even before the announcement came, was that it would be mandates that made the biggest difference in terms of bumping our numbers of those protected um, up. 
So, you know, I still think even with the approval, you know, we still have work to do. And, and you know, many of us here work with black and brown communities or from those communities, you know, white conservative communities in rural parts of Maryland and other parts of the country are also those right now actually who are really hesitant and remain so. And, you know, that will be one of our challenges to address what their concerns are and their questions are and, and who are the trusted messengers, you know, for, for those folks. But can I, can I just ask, can I take this off your question, Mayor Neal, for a moment and ask questions? No problem. Go ahead. Dr. Campbell, just because he's in, immersed in the clinical trials, is parents obviously are just, you know, eager. Many parents are eager for when they can get their kids vaccinated. So can you talk to us about, I think many don't understand the complexities of, you know, kind of moving down the age groups, testing the dosages. When do we expect to see vaccine um, packages submitted for, for emergency use authorization for kids under 12? Sure, thanks. Um... Yeah, so the process, as you laid out a little bit, Dr. Quinn, is we are looking at different dosages compared to the adult dose of all of the vaccines that are available for adults and teens right now. And because we want to make sure we have the right, the right one for kids, the younger kids. And Pfizer is the furthest along. Um, they already have all of the five to 11 year olds enrolled in a study um, and are pretty close to being able to analyze those data on safety and immune responses and provide them to the FDA. It's always hard to predict the exact time, but my prediction would be in about two months, they'd be able to get it to the FDA. And that would mean sometime before the end of the calendar year that that vaccine might be available. So we'd have it down for, uh, to elementary school level. Moderna is about a month behind, just like they were for adults. So we're doing the Moderna trial. And so that's gonna be more like the very end of the year or the very beginning of next year for the, and for them it's six to 11 year olds. And then each of the subsequent lower age groups is gonna be months behind that. Um, so it won't be really until the end of the school year that we've got down below that for those two first ones, I would say. That's all dependent on making sure that it really is safe, that it really is effective, that the FDA agrees with the data as given to them. But you know, best guess, best crystal ball at this point is, is what I just told you. Now, one really important point I think for everybody is please do not ask that your children get vaccinated with the vaccines before we have the data because it's not safe. To, to just assume that the adult dose is right, for people to try to make their own mixture because they think they know how to dilute out the adult vaccine. It's, um, that's why we're doing these studies is to get those data. And even though we wish they were done already, um, they're not. And we want to be able to give us, you know, to have those really strong data to provide people. So don't jump the gun and try to convince your doctor to, or your, you know, anybody to give you the vaccine to your kids before it's ready. You know, that gives a lot of credibility, Dr. Campbell, too, uh, to, for someone like you to say that, uh, because they have people down here in Alabama uh, taking uh, uh, cow and horse uh, deworming medicine, uh, trying to determine uh, what dosage they need and, and trying to figure it out on their own, and which is now also inundating our hospitals with people who have uh, uh, OD'd on worm medicine for horses and cows. So we got, we got a big, big problem uh, with that. What we're about to do is, uh, there, there is one thing that I wanna say, and in closing, I want, I want people to kind of address this. Uh, and this is from a, a person who's uh, uh, a comment and a question uh, from a person who's watching, is how can we invest more in public health to address community engagement, uh, because obviously community engagement is so very important. And most people don't know uh, public health and in, in, in how, it, how it 
interface with the regular healthcare system and how we look at the collective in public health. Uh, as, you, as you all um, uh, say your last statements, uh, for those of you who'd like to um, uh, answer that question, please help us with that as you, as you formulate your last questions. Uh, Dr. Campbell, I'm gonna start with you, sir, in your, in your final comments to our audience. Okay, thanks. So um, I want to answer your question. I also want to make sure I get the point across that COVID can be severe in kids, that more COVID is now about the 10th most common cause of death among children in the United States. People don't really realize that. Um, and the most common infectious disease cause of death among children in the United States currently, um, and higher than flu and up there with other problems. So it is way milder than in adults for COVID, but it's more severe than other diseases in children. But really important point that you brought up, Mayor Neal, and that is we need to start changing the way we think about how public health works because it's not doctors and epidemiologists and people at academic centers that um, have all the answers or should be trying to pretend that they have all the answers. It's the public. It, the public in public health is so important. And we finally started realizing that in clinical trials that having engagement with the participant and the community has improved the way that we do medicine and trials. We need to start thinking about that for public health. It will only be from the public that our public health gets better. Um, and I know Dr. Quinn is gonna say it more eloquently, but. I feel really strongly that that's the case. And any way that we can convince the people who do the funding and who do the, you know, like what's important in, in where we go with public health, um, I, I'm completely on board with exactly the way that you said it. And uh, kudos to you. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jim Campbell. Uh, Dr. Sandra Quinn, you, since he introduced you, uh, you up next. What's your closing comments? And please uh, uh, comment on on the question as well. So you know, I, I I could not be more passionate about the importance of supporting public health professionals, public health infrastructure, and and supporting their ability to engage with communities. And that means having adequate resources to train public health professionals who may not have worked with black or brown or, you know, different communities. It also means literally investing in public health. Part of our dilemma through this whole pandemic is we have disinvested in public health and public health professionals and the training in public health for decades. And if this pandemic disappeared tomorrow, you know what? We'd say, eh, we don't need that money going into public health anymore because we have a history of doing that. And then when the next pandemic came around, we'd say, where are those people? So part of that investment is investing in finding those people who are the voices of their community and getting them engaged and being certified as community health workers you know, who are the people who can knock on a door that I can't knock on and that the clinicians don't have time to knock on and, and have somebody open it and ask their question and listen, you know. So I think it's investing in the infrastructure, it's investing in the training, and it's investing in the community partnerships. You know, we know you don't, in, in the preparedness world, one of the adages is, you don't build a partnership at the time the event has happened. You know, I think Gloria said it, you know, you, this is a long-term engagement and we must remember that. So talk to your county council people, talk to your state legislators, tell your Congress people, tell your senators that we have to support public health. Thank you. I, I'm glad that you had the forum to make that statement. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Terrence King, uh, man, it's so wonderful meeting you, sir. Um, you. Your your Thank final you. comment to uh, to uh, the listening 
So uh, I've, 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 the final comment is I've thoroughly enjoyed the discussion tonight, not only so much information, but I thank you, Dr. Thomas, for just the platform uh, that you've given me to express my opinion. On this issue, I would go at three points. And these are points that I talk to my colleagues and mentees who are still senior executives back across HHS. And that I testified before Congress uh, recently to discuss this very issue around uh, a, a public health kind of issues and what should be done. Three points. One, I think there is a misnomer, follow the dollar. Number one, as a senior executive, I was to a great extent responsible for the money that came to Maryland, the laboratory of states as it relates to hospital systems and healthcare payment. And there is money that goes millions to hospital systems to do what you said, engage with communities. And really, it's not happening. That money stops there. And stipends are given to community leaders. The president of Baltimore City Council and the city council has asked for a conversation between myself and the people who run that payment process for the state of Maryland and certainly for Baltimore. So that conversation will happen soon because the expectations that the feds have is not occurring. Number two, as you look at this, there's also an LHIC process, a process in Baltimore City's health department where we make, we're making the decision together as to what happens in the post-COVID era. So how that engagement will increase. And lastly, I'll say quickly, I believe that churches have already proven, communities have already proven, we're set to be clinics. If we can give vaccines in a rush in that building, why can't we do screenings? Why can't we do education? Why can't there be immunization programs beyond COVID? So what does that mean? Give some of the ownership to the community itself and let us work in partnership with the health department and get these other systems out of our way. Thank you. That's, that's powerful, man. Thank you so very much. Uh, Dr. Don Milton, uh, your, your final comments uh, uh, to uh, our uh, viewing and uh, listening audience. I was just uh, reviewing something from uh, my religious organization that I, I'm a member of. My wife is a retired minister, and she forwarded me this thing. I was talking about uh, encouraging members of our congregations to get vaccinated. And one of the things they were pointing out is that people need to be aware that the people who are spreading this misinformation are making billions of dollars a year off of feeding you garbage. And you think maybe you don't want to contribute to the pharmaceutical company making money off of vaccines. Believe me, you're contributing to these charlatans making money, feeding you junk. Wow. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Milton. I really do appreciate you. Uh, Dr. Sarah Hancock. Folks, Dr. Sarah Pope. <laughs> um, so uh, three quick comments. Um, one way to protect kids is for adults to get vaccinated. The second is that kids do not exist in isolation and their health and well-being is dependent on the, on the health and well-being of their parents. And because of that, pediatricians are interested in issues that affect all members of the family. So if, if we are happy to be part of a conversation about why to get the vaccine and, and parents or caregivers of kids should feel free to bring this up. This is a totally appropriate topic for pediatric care. And finally, in regards to, to public health, um, I mean, luckily I think we're all in heated agreement that 90% of what determines whether we're healthy or not happens outside of the healthcare setting. And so that's where the investment needs to be in prevention and in well-being and in thriving as opposed to treating problems after they've happened. Uh, this will take real investment. Um, and, but I think 
COVID has given us some, some helpful examples of where to invest these hyper-local responses that uh, Reverend King was talking about that have really made a difference in communities that have historically um, um, suffered worse outcomes because of disinvestment. So let's use those as a starting point for rebuilding public health infrastructure outside of clinics and outside of hospitals. That's powerful. Thank you so much, Dr. Pope. Uh, Dr. Yolandra Hancock, your final comments. Thank you, Mayor Neal. So I, I'll give you three M's, money, manpower, and mutual respect. Money meaning don't commit money simply to COVID response, but truly to public health. Here in Prince George's County, uh, less than 1% of our budget was committed to public health, not health care and everything else, but specifically public health, less than 1%. I credit um, County Executive also Brooks for putting more funds into public health, but it was specifically earmarked for COVID-19 responses. So in 2022, when prayerfully we are over um, the majority of the cases in COVID because everybody's gotten a shot and somehow we've gotten herd immunity either through natural infection or um, the vaccination, then what? what does that 2023 budget look like? It should still be reflective of addressing the social determinants of health that Dr. Pope referred to. The second, manpower. And when I say manpower, I mean, who's out doing public health, right? When I got my degree at Hopkins, it was very whitewashed. Every professor I had did not look like me. We talk about representation in medicine, but we very rarely talk about representation in public health. So my colleagues will research the community. They will go to, Dr. to Reverend King and ask him to participate and have his congregation recruited. They'll get the grant money, pay for their salary, and then we get a $25 gift card to Giant. So there has to be parity when you get an NIH K grant and you get a good $500,000, $2 million, but you're giving $25 gift cards to, in, from Giant to the community, then why would he commit his congregation? And then when it comes to mutual respect, I uh, taught until August 31st at GW in the community oriented primary care um, track within prevention and community health. What I taught my students was you partner with, work for and in the community. They don't work for you, you work for them. So when you go in, you find out what their priorities are, what their assets are. A lot of times this conversation about vulnerable populations, um, disenfranchised populations, they're not vulnerable. The system creates vulnerability. They're strong and resilient. So how are you recognizing those things and allowing them to take a leadership role where you just serve as a partner in what they are trying to achieve? Part of it being education, addressing whatever issues they may have, and pairing that with trying to get them vaccinated so that our babies can return to school safely. Boy. I what? echo what Dr. Delandra <laughs> Hancock is saying. Amen, sister. <laughs> you know, you know, I, 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 you know, I want to pass the plate down, you know, you and Dr. King. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Between the two of you, all, I don't know. <laughs> I, should, I feel like I need communion now, <laughs> like you said, Gloria. <laughs> uh, let Gloria, say something, uh, at, at least say something, then we're going to go to Dr. T and then I'll close this up. No, no, thank you very much. As always, this is uh, so energizing, so ready to go outside and be talking to people. Remember, plain language and also in different languages is critical. People want to hear, people want to know, and it's up to us to get out of there and be in front of them and build those relationships after, uh, as Dr. Hancock is saying here, partnership. You have the face-based organizations, you have the nonprofit, you have the community centers where they are coming there and you have it all ready for you. Come with the empathy, intentionality, and love. Thank you so much, Gloria. <laughs> um, you know, Dr. T, you, 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 you mentioned and you always edify me. Let me edify you. Let me thank you uh, so much for, uh, for what you do, both seen and unseen, uh, to create forums like this, opportunities to be real, uh, and, um, and, and having the wherewithal uh, to have the, uh, the reach and, and the database that you can reach out to people with this level of expertise who are real, but yet and still know what they're talking about as well. And, and that's the real deal. So thank you so very much uh, for what you do. Dr. T. Now it's up to you. Go ahead. 
Well, uh, Mayor Neal, you, uh, you're a source of inspiration, and I just want to thank uh, all of you. What an amazing evening we've had tonight. Think about it. When was the last time you had a real conversation, a little back and forth? We didn't have to agree on everything, but we learned something tonight. And I'm so glad to have our scientists. Dr. Campbell, I can't wait to take you to the barbershop. It's another sacred space. As, as Reverend Terrace King talks about, it's a space where we can plant a flag and help bring our communities around to understanding the importance of participating in clinical trials. So I would simply say this, I think we're at a defining moment. When I see people fighting at a school board about masks, I'm saying to myself, I wanna like who we are when we're over this. If we're not careful, we're not gonna like who we have become going through this. That's number one. Number two, there's a lot of trauma out there, not only in the communities before COVID, but of the 640 plus uh, thousand people dead, a, a disproportionate number of them are black and brown. We got to help people heal. Uh, we heard young people say, a person say, I gave it to my grandmother. This is at a funeral. I killed my grandmother. That's a big burden to carry. We have to help people over that. And then last, really lifting up the human subjects. I'm using the term human subjects because that at the end of the day is still what NIH calls them. But if we don't have people willing to participate in research, then we're flying blind with the results. And maybe when our people participate in research and we deliver back to them the results results back to the community, not just in our medical journals and scientific journals, but literally deliver like these town halls. Here's the results of our research that can build ownership. And so we're going to, uh, Reverend King's got the church. We got the barbershops and between them, we got a place where we can connect our, our clinical trials uh, and our education and outreach. I want to just thank all of you. I've met some new friends here tonight, Dr. Hancock. We're just meeting here tonight. So good to meet you. And uh, throw the ball back to Omar Neal and send us home. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank each and every one of you individually and collectively for a wonderful evening. Um, you know, and, and as uh, you know, Dr. King said, you know, I have points. That's how they, that's how they do in church. I got three points. Well, I got four words. <laughs> and those four words are you got the power. <laughs> that's it. That, <laughs> that, 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 that you, you got the power that we can really make a difference if we decide to work together on this, that this is a we thing. It's not me. It's not you. It's us. And, and, and we are our brother's keeper. And, and, and we are uh, responsible for each other because I cannot be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. And you can't be who you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. We are interrelated and interdependent. And that's why it's important that we recognize that we are all possessors of some truth. And as we bring our truths together, then and only then, do we get closer to the truth. Thank you for sharing your truth with us tonight. And as always, I'd like to leave you with these two words. Remember that I love you with the perfect love. But more importantly, remember this, you got the power. Until All next right, time. <laughs> you got the power. I want to put up a little announcement about our next uh, community event. And uh, uh, Dr. Sarah Polk, you're going to be part of this as we roll out and, re and, and release our CommuniVax report back to the community. And Dr. Hancock and uh, uh, Dr. Milton and our other guests, uh, welcome. I want you to be part and see how we do this. Thank you all. Be safe out there.